How many of you here play chess? Raise your hands. Oh, the intellectuals. I play the computer. I have moved up a couple levels. I started at easy. I've moved up. Um, I'm on a level now where I can probably only win two out of 10 times. I can beat the computer. Uh, the computer is incredibly smart, but I, I'm trying my best. What happens is each, well, nearly every member of the board has a different move. Like this is the pawn, it can only move one or two spaces. Uh, this is the knight, and this uh, horse, which is called the knight, can only move on an L, okay? Which, this is the castle, and it only can move straight. Um, this is the queen, and she basically is like all queens, she can go anywhere she wants. <laughs> the key to chess is to know your opponent and where your opponent's gonna go. Great chess masters, and that's what they call them. By the way, one of the greatest chess masters today is a young lady out there right now. She is from Korea, and she's just, she's incredible. Is to know your opponent, where they're moving, what they're doing, and to know their head. To be, uh, to be able to know the next four moves of them so you can be able to defeat them. I'm not good at that. I, but I do know how to move, and I, I try to keep winning against the computer. But the point is, it, it's the key here is to do the proper move in order to make your king uh, go into defeat, which we call checkmate. I never title a sermon, but today I have titled it, It's Your Move. And what we deal with, we're starting with the book of Colossians. And for the next few months, we're gonna be dealing with the book of Colossians. But what we want to do is deal with the foundation of Colossians today, and it's in Colossians chapter one, verse three. Would you read it with me? We, Colossians one, three, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Christ, when we pray for you. Why? Because you, the church of Colossus, you heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that springs up from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel. That has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing much fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard and truly understood God's grace. You learned this faith and grace and love for God's people, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on behalf and who also told us of the love you have in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so somebody says to me, Colossae, the city of Colossians, What's so important about it? Well, the fact is it's in the Lycoris Valley. It's in between Ephesus and, and the, um, the Aegean Sea. Now, the reason it's so important is it's much like Toronto. It's a multicultural city. It, it, it has everybody importing and exporting. People from all the world have come to this city. It has every kind of religious, philosophical belief, just like Toronto. It has a very strong left wing, has a very strong liberal belief wanting to try to change everybody. The latest trends are coming to Classe, and they are coming in through the GNC or the coming to Ephesus and so forth. It was written in 62 AD by Paul and Timothy. Was anybody alive in 62 AD? Just please raise your hand. In the first service, we had three people. <laughs> now, Epaphras, okay, I love that name. Epaphras, Gordon Franz, he talks about Epaphras, and he's mentioned Epaphras three times, one in Colossians 1, Colossians 4, and then Philemon's verse 23. The craziest thing about Epaphras, and let me just take you to this, okay? He was a Gentile, just like Luke, who wrote the book of Luke and the book of Acts, he was a Gentile too. 
The, the reason I'm saying this is, Epaphras was the one who really got the Church of Colossae going. It wasn't the apostles, it wasn't the disciples, it wasn't a Jewish person, it was a guy named Epaphras. Now, somebody says to me, what, uh, this Epaphras guy, this first time I've ever heard of him, well, let me tell you about him. In Colossians 1, 7, it says, our dear fellow servant, he's a servant. Number two, in Colossians 1, 7, halfway through, he's a faithful minister. In Colossians 4, it says he's a bond servant, which means he did not get paid for his ministry. He did it free. In Philemon, verse 23, he's a fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. In other words, he's been in prison with Paul for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So somebody says to me, why are we studying Colossians? Because the fact is Colossians is so much like Toronto. There's a thing called the Colossae or the Colossian heresy. Pluralism was in the church. There's more than one way to get to God. There's more than one way to worship him. The Bible can be stretched. We can water down the Bible. This is exactly what the churches in Toronto have done. And for this reason, so many churches are empty or they're ripped down and condos have gone up, okay? The second is uh, syncretism, where they're blending different thoughts together and they're diff di different practices together. So, they're, 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 you know what, we can worship Jesus, but we also can pray to somebody else. Where is that in the Bible? This guy comes along who's a Gentile, Epaphus. He's not called by the church in Jerusalem. He's not called by the apostles. He's not called by anything. He just has accepted Jesus. He got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, and he thought, I'm going to tell everybody. So he goes to this town called Colossae. Nobody else has gone there. And he opens his mouth, and he starts telling people. Somebody says to me, what is the root to Epaphus? Why was he so great? Because he had an incredible prayer life, constant prayer life, consistent he was intense in his prayer. In other words, when he asked for something, he, he was very specific. He was also um, an incredible prayer. Let me give you three things he did for the church in Colossae, which we read the scripture, and you probably didn't get it. Number one, he gave them faith in Christ. Number two, he taught God's people to love each other. And number three, he, he taught people how to be open and love the Holy Spirit. Okay, so somebody says, how did the church classy do this? Epaphras. Now, let me take you to all three of these because I want to go through this, and I know I'm moving fast, but you'll get it. Okay, here we go. Number one, this guy named Epaphras comes along to Colossae. He's not from Colossae, he, he, but he, he loves Jesus so much he wants everybody to know it. He sees this town, multicultural people like the city of Toronto, and he says, these people need Jesus because of pluralism and syncretism and so forth. And all of a sudden, he starts gaining a group of people around him and starts teaching them. And here's the number one lesson you get today. Are you ready? If you're trying to figure why you're here on earth, you're here to help people get faith in Christ. You're not here to own a huge house, 10 cars, 42 shoes, 77 pairs of underwear. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? You understand? You are here. God put you on earth, hello, to help people have faith in Christ. Now, there's nothing wrong if you can afford a house, nothing wrong with a car, if you can afford a car. I drive a beautiful pickup truck, 2013 Ram pickup truck. It's my baby. I told my wife when I die, just put me in the truck, put the truck in the hole, I'll go with my truck, okay? I don't mind, okay? The reason I drive a Ram, because it says Ram. I'm allowed to hit people. Okay, and the fact is this, that's why I drive it, so, okay. Here's the crazy thing. He comes along, he says, I'm gonna give you and help you get faith in Christ. How? Epaphras shows his testimony. Number two, he starts to live and use the word of God. 
He starts telling people about the Jesus he knows, the Jesus who did miracle, the, the power of God, how it lines up to the Old Testament. He's a Gentile. He doesn't preach the Jesus who's just Jewish. This is a Jesus for everyone. And all of a sudden, he also starts to pray with people, and they start to experience God. When was the last time you prayed with somebody who was a non-believer and you just said to them, I, can, can I pray for you? Uh, it'll be 30 seconds. If, if it bothers you, I won't. I've had so many non-believers say, yeah, sure, go ahead. I mean, yeah, I'll take it. I had one guy say, yeah, go ahead. It won't hurt, will it? <laughs> Not today. So, so he's here to give faith in Christ. Are you ready? Number two. Epaphras, he comes to Colossae to help God's people love each other. Now, there isn't anybody, but when the church starts to grow in his ministry, he teaches everybody to love each other. Now, I'm going to give you one of the most painful illustrations in my ministry, and it hurts me. Now, it won't be painful to you, but it hurts me. A few years ago, I'm in downtown Toronto. I see this young man in our, from our church, and he hasn't attended our church for a couple years. So I go up to him and I say to him, hey, I haven't seen you in a long time. How are you doing? Fine. You, you ever talk to somebody, they, 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 just the word fine, you know they have attitude? And I said, how come I haven't seen you? He says, I don't like you. I will never come to your church. I can't stand your ministry. And I looked at him, I said, can I ask you why? I said, you grew up in the children's ministry, you went to the junior high program, you went to youth, you never even came into the sanctuary. I don't remember you ever, I've never sat under your preaching, but I can't stand you. And I said, okay, then tell me why. He said, well, he said, you know, ever since I was a kid, mom and dad after service would come home and I would hit everything you did wrong during the sermon, and I had to eat lunch every Sunday hearing my parents tell me about how bad you are. And he said, I grew up hating you because of my parents at Sunday lunch. I said, like what? Well, you don't preach normal. You say weird things. You're different. You don't stand behind a pulpit. You don't have a suit on. And I said, are you kidding me? I said, you've been poisoned. How dare you talk about my parents that way? I said, well, think about it. I said, you're judging me, and you haven't even been in the sanctuary to judge. I said, listen, you know, I'm sorry. He said, yeah, whatever, and he walked away. Can I just share this with you? If you're looking for a perfect church, stay with television evangelists, okay? Because then you don't need to be with people. But what are you gonna do when you get to heaven and you find out there are no TV evangelists, and you have to be with people. I don't mean this to be rude, and I'll lose my live stream audience, but there is no live stream in heaven. There is no taxes, there is no internet, and for some of you, there's no texting. You're gonna go nuts. Here's the craziest thing, are you ready? He comes and he teaches people, let me show you how to love each other. Yes, you're not perfect and I'm not perfect and once in a while we're gonna bug each other. Do you know that in this church there are people who sit in the same seat every Sunday if somebody else sits in their seat? It's a major sin. We've had people go to Ed and say to Pastor Ed, could you please tell that person to move, that's my seat. We used to have in this church years ago pews for people who do not understand what pews are. They're wooden benches that hurt your butt when you're sitting on them. They're just wooden benches. Are you ready? We got rid of the wooden benches. One, because they were pink, okay? Number two, these are much more comfortable. Number three, we ship them all over to the Ukraine and four churches in Ukraine have our wooden benches and they thank us for it. When we're getting rid of the wooden benches, you think I was a sinner from the pit of hell. 
where people, I've sat in that bench for the last 55,000 years, and, and I used to say to them, well, let me ship the bench to your house, and you can build a casket, and you can bury yourself in the pew. <laughs> That's before I had the fruit of the Spirit. Can I share this with you? This guy wasn't an apostle. He wasn't one of the big 12. He wasn't some big dude from the upper room. He wasn't a, he was just a normal Joe called Epaphras. And he says, I'm going to class A, why? I'm gonna teach people to love each other. He showed it, he used the word God, he used prayer. He showed them the eternal benefits of loving each other. Whether you like it or not, if you're in the body of Christ, we're brothers and sisters, and brothers and brothers. We're family. I just ate supper a couple weeks ago with my brother from Massachusetts, okay? He's an American, I'm a Canadian. We know we don't talk about certain things. I don't care about Biden. I don't care about Trump. He doesn't care about the Toronto Maple Leafs. We are good, but he's my brother. It doesn't matter if he goes to prison or not, he's still my brother, I love him. And that's how we need to treat, and this Joe called Epiphas goes into Klasse and says, hey, I don't care if you're from this culture, I don't care if you're this color, I don't care if you're male or female, we're going to all be one under the love of Jesus, let's love each other. By the way, just so you know, are you ready? What you sow, you reap. You poison your kids, your kids will be poisoned. You teach your kids to love the people in the church, your kids will be love. Then the third thing, he taught them to be open and love the Holy Spirit. I love this. Again, he used the word, he went back to the upper room, explaining the upper room experience, explaining baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, so forth. I was out a year ago with a friend of mine, he's agnostic, and we're having supper, we sit down at the restaurant, just before the waiter even comes to ask us what we want, and he, we sit down and I said, so how are you? He says, I have a question for you. I said, good. He says, do you speak in tongues? We haven't even ordered our meal. I said, excuse me? He says, I was reading in the Bible about these people in some room who spoke in tongues. Do you speak in tongues? And I said, yeah. Now, he's agnostic, you understand? Yeah, I do. He said, seriously, what's it like? And so I started explaining to him the openness. So this is exactly what Epaphras did. He went into the closet. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not a Christian. Let me tell you about the Jesus who heals. Let me tell you about the Holy Spirit that helps you speak in time. Let me tell you about the Holy Spirit that's in you, that gives you power. And he starts giving his testimony. So somebody says, give me application. I need to take something home, da, 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 da. Are you ready? Your ministry, I'm not talking about my ministry, your ministry has eternal investment. Now listen to me, you were born to minister. You were born to minister. Your hands, and whether you believe this or not, your hands were made to pray for people. Your voice was made to share the love of Jesus. And this Epaphras guy, he makes a stinking move. You know what? It's like the devil's going to win this game. No way, man. Colossae's mine. And he starts to make the right moves with the right, and he, 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 in Jesus' name, Lord, show me what the devil's doing so I can win. He makes the right moves. Ministry is eternal. Can I share this with you? I have nothing against houses and cars and so forth. We all need to live. But when your priority is your career versus your ministry, hello. Number two, application. Point the people in biblical direction. The heresy, the pluralism, 
the syncretism that was in Classe. And what he does is he turns them around and he points them. Are you ready? He points them in a biblical direction. He doesn't point them towards, you know, Epiphras ministry and Epiphras books, okay? God forbid the day you ever put a picture of me in the lobby. The day you do that, I'll run in here and I'll rip it down. It's Jesus who is Lord. It's Jesus who's the king. He is the boss of the church. You understand? And you don't give glory to anybody except Christ. Now, here's the third one I'm going to give to point to people in biblical direction. Faith in Christ. Let me show you how to give faith in Christ, biblically. Let me show you how to love God's people through the Holy Spirit. Let me show you how to be open. Number three, application. I love this one. Do your best and learn. You are going to make mistakes. I would love to write a book on all the mistakes I've made. Oh, my goodness. When I first started in ministry, okay? Now, some of you don't think I have a filter now. Oh, you should have met me. Oh, my goodness. See, I believe the truth would set people free, but I never had love or encouragement or gentleness or anything like this. I didn't know about the fruit of the Spirit. I just knew the truth will set you free. You know what I mean? And, and uh, uh, boy... And now the Lord is working on me about, you know, maybe you should put a little gentleness and kindness in it too. The mistakes you make. You're going to make mistakes, but here's the craziest thing. It's better to make a mistake than to sit there and lose the game. The last one I give you is disciples developing disciples. That's the vision of our church for the last 20 years. You're a disciple of Christ, he's Lord. Whether the person's a believer or a non-believer, your job is to help develop them to get closer to Christ. You know, every non-believer I meet, well, not everyone, I try to figure out, Lord, how can I minister to them so they can get to Christ? How can I minister so I can get to Christ? So with this, I tell you a story that I've told before, but it, it's, it means a lot to me. We're family, therefore we're allowed to talk like family, okay? When you're not, you know, there's two kinds of talk. There's family talk, and then when you get outside, you gotta be normal. Okay, so we're family, are you ready? How many of you have had diarrhea? Raise your hand. <laughs> Come on, raise your hand if you've ever had diarrhea. Come on. Is there anybody who's never had diarrhea? Seriously, seriously, come on. Okay, so you all had diarrhea. You, you just didn't raise your hand. You're lying then. Okay, you've had diarrhea, okay? If you've never had diarrhea, let me cook for you. I will set you free. Okay, are you ready? Are you ready? I had a, a disease called proctitis. It's bleeding of the bowels. It's like diarrhea. I had 30 seconds to get to the toilet or I would fill my drawers full of blood. And I had a go bag. I carried a go bag with me. Everybody, would, nobody knew what. I just carried a little knapsack over my shoulder. Anywhere I went, go shopping anywhere, I had a go bag. It had uh, uh, wet wipes, it had new underwear, it had uh, pants, everything because I had 30 seconds, if I, and wherever I went, example, going into Sherway Mall, I can tell you every washroom in Sherway Mall. I can tell you where there are washrooms that you don't even know there's washrooms. I have met bushes where there are no washrooms. I've done a Moses in the bush. Let me explain this to you. When you have proctitis and you got 30 seconds, you count, because you know you got 30 seconds. I was pre, a professor at a Bible college in Peterborough, Ontario. I was preaching over 100 times a year at conferences, retreats, conventions, stuff like this, churches. And I'm bleeding like crazy. I'm supposed to go to Manchester, England to speak at a college university lecture 
on Canadian Christianity. Before I went, I went to see my specialist who was dealing with me about the bleeding in the bowels. He loved me because I am a Gentile pastor and he is a Jewish specialist. So he always loved to sit with me and try to talk to me about Messiah, Jesus, all this stuff. When you're being examined by the specialist, you don't really want to talk to him about anything. It's very invasive. I went and saw him just before I'm going to England, and he said, you can't go to England, you're bleeding too much. He said, you're going to get to England, and he says, you're going to bleed to death, or they're going to rip your bowels out. He said, stay here. And I said, I, I don't know what to do. And Shelly, my wife, she says, well, let's pray. So we went down to our Honda. We, at that time, we had a Honda Accord, and we prayed with each other in one accord. And all of a sudden, Shelly turns to me and she says, the Lord wants you to go. Now I'm thinking two things. Either she's, this is the will of God, or she has a life insurance policy on me. You know what I'm thinking? And I said, I went. So this is what happened. I showed up at the airport early, and I walked up the counter, British Airways, which I appreciate to this day, and I said, can I talk to somebody who's in charge? And this guy comes up from British Airways. I said, hi. I'm not well, I have to speak in Manchester, England at a lecture, and I, I'm a professor, and I'm wondering if you can help me get across to England properly. He said, yeah, no problem. He said, we have this all the time. We can help you, no problem. He said, follow me. He took me down to the gate. He whispered something to the lady at the gate, and all of a sudden they took me on, are you ready? A 747. You know the two, two tier, 747. And when they walked, I'm, already, they took me up the stairs to the second deck of the 747. And it was business class. Can you imagine? Business class, rich people. And, and the flight attendant says, here's your seat. We're going to take care of you the whole flight. Anything you need will help you. I said, thank you so much. When we got up in the air, the flight attendant comes to me and says, could you please follow me? I'm thinking they're kicking me down to economy or cargo. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I go with her, and she says, here is a little room in the back where flight attendants rest during the flight. Go in there, the lower bunk is yours. I've always wondered where flight attendants go through halfway through the flight. After they give you peanuts, they disappear. <laughs> they go to their, their little room and they play poker and they sleep. Are you ready? I'm in there lying. I fall asleep. They come wake me up, said, we're landing soon. Come sit down in your So I go and put my seatbelt on. I had beautiful, and then all of a sudden they take me from Heathrow Airport up to Manchester to speak. When we get there, the chancellor of the school says to me, I'm sorry, we're not doing your, your thing tonight. We're doing it tomorrow. I'm sorry, you go to your room, enjoy. So I get in my room and I'm, I'm studying my notes about Canadian Christianity. And all of a sudden the Lord says, you're not speaking this, you're going to talk about divine healing. And I, I, this is why I said, God, hello, I'm sick. How do I talk about healing when I'm bleeding and you never paid for my flight. They want me to speak about this. Well, go ask them. So I go to the president and the chancellor, two guys, and I said, yo, do you mind if I change my topic to divine healing? Oh no, go ahead. This would be a lot of fun hearing you speak about divine healing. So I show up the next day, and I got my little gold bag, I'm ready to bleed, and I'm going to talk about divine healing, and all of a sudden, everybody's there, around 370 students, and faculty are in the front row, and I start to say, hi, I'm supposed to talk about Canadian Christianity, I'm not going to, I like to talk about divine healing. And all of a sudden, I said, but before I do, I need to tell you, I have my little go bag, I'm bleeding from my bowels, I might have to leave really quick, but don't worry about me, I'm not gonna die. But the point is this, I am sick, just like Paul had a thorn in the flesh, I am sick too, but when I am weak, he is strong. And for the next half an hour, I talked to them about divine healing, having faith in Christ, whether you're sick or well, it doesn't matter, you still have faith in Christ. Here I am, I am Epiphras, trying to build faith in Christ into the student body. 
At the end of my lecture, the president stood up and he said, prove it. I said, prove what? Let people come forward who are sick and you, you, you pray for them the way you think you should pray and let my administrative assistant follow you. We'll take their email and we'll track and see how many of them get healed. I said, oh, just like a scientific lab. He said, exactly. He said, you're at university, let's see. I said, sure. So 12 people came forward and everyone stayed. And I prayed for each person quietly and, and, and she took the email and so forth. And then at the very end, I was totally exhausted and I, I'm sitting there shaking hands, saying hello to people, and this, this lady comes up to me, and she goes, hello, my name is Sally. And I go, hello, Sally, how are you? I've been a Christian for five days. I said, five whole days, eh? I said, praise the Lord. She says, I know, when you were speaking, Jesus told me to pray for you, and you will be healed. And I go, five whole days, eh? Hello. <laughs> do, 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 do. Oh, God, help me. Let the gold bag work right now. And all of a sudden, I said to her, that's wonderful. And I'm lying through my teeth. I'm thinking, oh, God, call the rapture. Let's just get out of here, right? I mean, we got Wingnut City. And she goes, seriously, God wants to heal you. Can I pray for you? How do you say no? Right? How do you say no? So I said, yeah, go ahead. She goes, here's my problem, I don't know how. <laughs> I said, you don't know how what? I don't know how to pray for healing. I'm only a Christian for five days, could you teach me? I said, how about you just do your best? She says, I can do that. And she puts her hand on my belly button. And I'm looking down at her, Hannah, and she goes, hello, Jesus. <laughs> and I open my eyes and go, hello, Jesus? <laughs> I thought, oh my goodness. This is like Star Trek, boldly go where nobody's ever gone before, right? And she goes, I'm supposed to pray for your healing, his healing, uh, Jesus, stop the blood and uh, make him better. Oh, I think I'm supposed to use your name, Jesus. Jesus, bye-bye. <laughs> She, right? And I said, thank you so much. Trying to get rid of her. Right? Right? Because I'm a mature Bible college professor. I, you know. And she says, okay, come on, let's go to the toilet. I said, excuse me? <laughs> she says, well, we got to see if you're healed. I said, lady, I don't even go to the toilet with my wife. I said, we always have two toilets in the house. Okay, and she goes, no, we need to find out. Don't you want to find, I said, let's just believe. Is that the hypocrite Pharisee answer? Let's just believe, right? She said, no, we need to find out. I said, okay, let's go. Now, if you've never been to England, okay, I love England, okay, I'll have a lot of emails, okay? They don't have a lot of public toilets over there, okay? They need to invent some more. So all of a sudden we get to the, the toilet, which is just a toilet, and there's 11 people in line, but not for Sally. She goes, excuse me, I just prayed that he would be healed. Could all of you please just wait a couple minutes? Let him go in. Let's all just stand here and wait for him and see if he got healed. Of course, British people are so kind. Oh yes, after you, yes. <laughs> We'll have a cup of tea while you, uh, you poo-poo. Oh. Have you ever been in a toilet when there are 11 people waiting for you? <laughs> and the door is as thin as paper? And I'm sitting in there going, oh, Jesus. Just shoot me. Right? And all of a sudden, I'm thinking, I got to do something. I got to fake it or something. And then all of a sudden, I thought, no, let's just see. And all of a sudden, there's no blood. And I'm looking.
no blood. P.S. What does the Bible say? Childlike faith. And I come out and I say to her, thank you. I'm healed. And she says, of course. I get off the airplane because I emailed my wife, told her the good news. She says, the doctor is waiting for you. I said, excuse me? I phoned him and told him that Jesus, the Messiah, healed you. He doesn't believe me. So I go in to my specialist, who has now become a friend of mine, and he says, Pastor, I'm so glad to see you. I heard. Let's see if it's real. Now, I won't tell you how they examine you, but let's put it this way. It's not nice. And he decides to go in one end and come out the other. And he says, there's only scar tissue. He said, this is impossible. This is totally impossible. He said, please, sit down and tell me about your Jesus. Why do I tell you that story? Sally, five days in the faith, realizes that she was made not to just attend church, but to be part of the church. And she made her move in the Holy Spirit. And how many of us are sitting in the back row hoping somebody else does it instead of us? This guy, Epaphras, faith in Christ I'm gonna help you with. We're all going to learn to love each other even though we have faults. And I'm going to teach you how to love the Holy Spirit and be open so he can help you in everything you do. I want to be like Epaphras. Not here because this is my job. Here because this is my ministry. My ministry.